Hey, in this episode, I have Maya Radcliffe with Hawaii Fluid Art on, and this is one of my favorite podcasts I think I've ever recorded. We get very real. We talk about uh, her story, how she got started, the decisions that she made, whether she knew it at the time or, or, or it kind of just happened, but why they were so critical to the success that she's having today as a franchisor. She's an emerging brand, but has quite a few locations open with a lot of leases signed and a lot in development, but you'll understand what sets her apart from so many other emerging brands out there. And you'll start to understand uh, how she cares about her team, how she cares about her franchisees, like really cares. And it's not, uh, it's not just something that's out there on social. So if you are interested in learning about an amazing founder and how to be a better franchisor, how a franchisee can, uh, can be such a brand advocate, this episode is going to be the one for you. Welcome to Franchise Secrets. I'm Eric Van Horn. As someone who's been both the franchisee and franchisor, I know the importance of connecting and learning from the best to become the best. In this podcast, I'll be interviewing both well-known and unknown successful entrepreneurs in franchising. I ask the questions that are on your mind and provide raw, authentic interviews to give you unique insights and strategies to succeed in franchising. Whether you're a seasoned franchisee, franchisor, or just starting out, this podcast is for you. Hey, Maya, welcome to the show. Well, good morning and aloha. Thank you for having me. You're not in Hawaii. Can you really say aloha if you're not in Hawaii? I can. It's it's a, a frame of mind to give to others and to always be authentic and pure. And that's aloha. Well, aloha. Back at you. Thank you. Well, how long did you live in Hawaii? Nine years. And where were you before Hawaii? Where where did you live? All over. I opened branches for Wells Fargo for many years. So California, Idaho, Missouri. Um, yeah, a, a lot of places. All well, over. Did Wells Fargo take you to Hawaii? Well, I went to I went to Hawaii working for Wells Fargo, and then I got laid off because I was too far from any uh, physical store. So I ended up being jobless and creating my own consulting company when I was on the island. So uh, everything virtual consulting. Then were you consulting a lot with the uh, people back in the in the states? No, I was actually consulting for local businesses on the Hawaiian Islands, and I would fly. Uh, usually four or five days a week, I would island hop. Uh, I helped restructure small to medium-sized businesses that were struggling, that needed uh, all new infrastructure, SOPs, hiring, firing, training, et cetera. And so it kept me very busy for nine years. All right. So let's get into the story of Hawaii Fluid Art, um, which is now a portfolio brand at Front Street Equity Partners. So we are thrilled about that. Um, we are not doing the outsourced franchise development. So that's different. This is at Front Street. We can do both franchise sales or, and strategic advisory or just strategic advisory. So we are strategic advisors to uh, Hawaii Fluid Art. And, um, but I wanted just to kind of make sure everybody knew that. Uh, so uh, uh, I just like to, for people to know if it's a brand that we're involved with versus not. Um, but why don't you tell us the story? How did that even start? Well, it started by accident in all reality. Um, I needed a hobby because I was working nonstop and on the weekends, I just didn't know what to do with myself. And I started going to art classes and I was horrible at all of them. I mean, terribly bad. And I would feel worse when I would get done with an art class. So I thought, gosh, this is not the way a hobby is supposed to feel. And so I started playing with paint on my own and watering it down and tilting it around a paper plate. And I had an idea was born and fast forward a little bit. I was posting my work on Facebook and people started buying it. And then people started asking me to teach. And I ended up teaching in the community and then opening a very fancy studio in my detached two car garage. <laughs> yeah. And this was on the big island? Yes. During the height of COVID, by the way, this was the height of COVID. So I, what I did is I put a little, uh, a little note on Facebook art classes this Saturday, such and such a time with address, please join me. And I had so many people show up that I couldn't take care of all of them. I had to do them in groups of 10. I didn't get done that night till about 10 o'clock. 
And over the next six months, I taught over a thousand people out of that garage. Wow. So, and at what point did you start to think like, boy, this is, well, at that point it's outgrowing the garage, but did you think like, Hey, this could be something big. Was there a, a moment or, uh, or a point in time where you're like, man, this, this could be something bigger than just a, a business out of a garage. Yes. Um, I realized that I needed a, a retail space because people were coming and going from my house every single day. So I opened my first location May 1st of 2021, but I also had a mobile unit and that mobile unit was a man in a van, me in the van. And I would go to, um, schools and retirement homes and big luxury hotels, et cetera. And one evening after I was done teaching some very well-known actors and actresses, they came up to me after uh, the class and said, hey, Maya, we need to talk to you. And my first thought was, I did something wrong. But that wasn't the case. They had been taking my classes for several months and said, hey, Maya, we want to talk to you. We've traveled the world and we've never seen anything like this. And we think everybody deserves to experience Hawaii fluid art. And for about two hours, we had a conversation about franchising, that they thought that I should franchise. And at that time, I knew nothing about franchising. I knew about business, but I didn't know anything about franchising. And I went home with my head in the sky and started researching franchising. And uh, yeah, that's how the franchising idea actually came into my mind. Did any of them know about franchising or have experience in franchising? Or did they just think like franchising because that's a bigger, a bigger thing? Um, one of them was a well-known attorney in Los Angeles who had worked with some other companies that had actually were franchises that went public and sold. And some of them owned franchises. And they just felt that I had a beautiful business unlike anything else in the United States and that people deserve to experience it. So it's not paint and sip because there's other franchises out there that are art type franchises so yeah um yeah so like what's different ab about hawaii fluid art versus a paint and sip type concept well there's a lot different um number one when you go to a competitor you're painting a a, a bird on a branch in front of a barn that you're not going to hang up in your house right it's an experience and it's fun but it doesn't turn out well well sometimes it does but it usually ends up in your garage or a closet or you throw it away and Hawaii fluid art, the art that you create is stunning. Anybody can do it with any ability or different ability. And it's about the experience. So that aloha spirit we give to the students throughout the entire class. We motivate them. We encourage them. We give them, you know, words of kindness. So not only do they create this beautiful piece of art, but when it's hanging on the wall in their home or office, every time they see it, they have emotional reaction because they felt so good in our stores. Not only that, but we also have a retail component. We feature local artists, artisans, jewelry makers, candle makers in the front of our store. So it's retail in the front and active art studio in the back. Attention franchisors and franchisees. There are two really important resources that I wanna share with you that will help you avoid costly mistakes and increase your enterprise value. The first is our free Facebook group. It's a community that has over 4,000 franchisees and franchisors in it. When somebody asks a question, they get honest and authentic answers from multiple perspectives. You can join the group for free over at franchisesecrets.com forward slash Facebook. The second resource I wanna share with you is if you're a franchisee and you wanna be around a community of successful Zs and other brands and in other industries, this is why I created the Franchisee Mastermind. If you want access to the best single and multi-unit owners to know what they're doing, or if you want to be around other multi-brand owners, then you'll want to check out my Franchisee Mastermind. The reason why people join is they want access to my Rolodex, my connections, to each other. They want to shortcut success, both short-term and long-term. Links will be in the show notes or at scalablefranchise.com. Where did you go from, from there? I, you know, you started, you got on Google that night cause you, you had something and then, and then what happened? Because, well, let's, let's talk about where you are today. And then I want to go back to like the, the process between where you started to where you are today. Cause it's, it's fast growth, not crazy, stupid, fast growth where it's uh, too fast, but it's, it's fast growth 
really organic in the sense that you've done so much of this yourself and with your with your team and you have a great team you've got great infrastructure in place and you have a great like you're just on have such a, a great trajectory of where you're going so give us a sense of that from the from the time that you started franchising to today where where are you in terms of franchising units etc so we're at just over 200 units sold but we know that doesn't really mean anything. It's really about how many units you have open. So we have 20 units open, but we have 45 leases signed. So those units will be opening in the next three to four months. We will comfortably be at 100 units open by the end of 2024. That's a lot of growth in a, in a short period of time. Um, how? So let, now let's go back to um, the beginning of the franchise, because I want people to have a sense of where you are. It's not just one or two locations open up right now with three or four units sold. It's 20, 20 open, 40 kind of in development, meaning lease assigned and, and, um, and then they'll just be on a, a track to open up more and you're selling at a good clip as well. So just a lot of momentum in the brand. Um, let's go back to, uh, how you got started in franchising. Cause I think this is important. I think there'll be a lot of lessons for, for franchisees, potential franchisees and franchisors in this part of the story. So, uh, research franchises to, um, getting your FDD and starting to, uh, starting to open up franchisees. So I was in Hawaii and Hawaii is a very unique market full of tourism, just very different. And I realized that it works in Hawaii, but would it work on the mainland? So I researched areas and I decided I was going to open a second location and I chose Kansas City, Missouri because they have tough winters compared to Hawaii. And it's just a different uh, environment there. And so I opened my second location October 10th, 2021. And between May and October, I worked on infrastructure and ideas and training videos. And I roughed out everything that I wanted to see when I was ready to launch. And it was a lot of work. It, it, it's not easy to do. You know, we even have a group medical plan, which is almost unheard of for our franchisees and their employees. And so I worked hard to create that, opened my second store, and it knocked it out of the park from day one. Just phenomenal. I still to this day, that store just shocks me. I just, I'm so in love with it. And so I spent all that time working on infrastructure and making sure that this was actually a brand that was sellable and that franchisees could have and own their own businesses successfully. Did you, how long were you in Kansas city? Did you move there to do this or was it kind of remote? How, how did that, how did you do that? Well, I was living in Hawaii. And so I flew out to Kansas city, picked out my location, flew home, they could get me the keys right away, flew back. I spent a month in Kansas City and I uh, stayed in the Hilton downtown and I was at that store every day. It only took us 10 days to do build out. Very, all of our stores have very simple build out. And then I put the store together and I just wanted to feel it, see it, smell it and be a part of it. Um, now when I open stores, I am completely remote. I'll fly in, oversee things and, um, and then go spend a couple of days when they first open. But I was definitely hands-on on that second opening. So are you talking about open up franchisee stores or opening up corporate stores? Both. So we have a location opening in Las Vegas, um, on the strip. I'm leaving on the 21st of this month and, um, I will actually be at that store for three weeks, but we have a training program and a setup program where we go to every franchisee's location and we train them on site and we help them pick out real estate prior to that where myself or trinity my director of real estate acquisition actually flies in and looks at the different real estate the brick and mortar options with the franchisee to help them choose what the best situation for them in that territory is going to be so we're very hands-on so we were talking earlier about one of your initial franchisees, and I think they visited you in Hawaii and or your location and became a franchisee, right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we, we've had several, actually. They were in Waikoloa, walking by, saw the store, went in to look at the art, uh, ended up doing an experience, fell in love, and our instructors are all trained to talk about the Hawaii Flute Art story. 
and say at the end, you know, we are a franchise family. If you're interested or if you know anybody that may be interested, we do have a franchising brochure out front. And I got a phone call the day that they got back from Hawaii saying it wasn't even asking questions. It was just like, we want a franchise. They were, <laughs> <laughs> they were so excited. They just wanted a franchise. Um, an interesting tidbit, their son now works for corporate as one of our corporate trainers. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I think it's interesting, um, Hawaii, I think it's smart for you to go and open up something in Kansas City. Most franchisors, and given the given the ability to just open up and start selling franchise right away or kind of proving out the model, they're going to open up and franchise right away versus prove it out. So I, I, I love that you went there and, and proved it out. I love that you have a location in Hawaii that is kind of a, a destination, a vacation destination place for people. And that's how a lot of brands, if you're thinking about how do I kind of organically get franchisees, if you have something that's more experiential like this or a restaurant or something where tourists would want to go into it, whether they're visiting um, on vacation in Hawaii, Vegas is, a, I mean, that's a, between Vegas and New York. I mean, there's so many people that that go through there. So I would imagine you will get a lot of franchisees just because you are open on the strip in Vegas. And I'm sure there's going to be franchise opportunity signs. It'll be experiential. And um, that's probably the perfect play. So I'm sure the store will do great, but the bigger play is, uh, is, is uh, franchisees out of that. So what a great, what a great idea. I think franchise wars, like just be thinking about that. Like when, you know, if you could open up corporate locations, it's nice to open them up in areas where you kind of prove out the model like Kansas City. But then once you do that, go to Vegas or New York if you can, or someplace where there's a lot of people that don't live there um, that get to see and experience your brand. So I cannot wait. When is that thing opening? When's it going to be open for business? And where is it on the Strip? It's uh, in the Fashion Show Mall on the Strip, on the north part of the Strip. It is a beautiful location and we open on- Is that the MGM? Uh, no, it's the Fashion Show Mall. It's the largest mall on the Strip. Um, it's kind of across from Aria. Um, it's, it's a very nice location. And that store opens January 10th. That's exciting. So you go in, you come from Aria, you go across the bridge, you go into the mall. Do you go left once you're in that mall? Because I, I was there. I think I, I think I know this. You go straight. You're going to go straight down. We are on the main corridor on the right hand side. I love it. It's going to be awesome. All right. So um, go back a little bit more. Why? Why start in Kansas City? Because that's it, it had to have been tempting. I'm just going to start this thing without proving it out. But I, why did you kind of insist or move forward with proving it out versus just starting to sell franchises? What is it about you that made you want to do that? I wanted to be sure that if I was going to offer something to the public, that it was tested and proven because I believe as a servant leader that I carry responsibility for my franchisees, for my potential franchisees. And I did not want to hope that my Hawaii model was going to work on the mainland. I wanted a proven record that I can say, whether it's this income level or this income level, whether it snows in the winter or is sunny all year long, all year long, that this model works. And that was very important to me to have that proven before I ever even offered anything to the public. And so that's what we did. So again, most brands don't do that, that we talk to. Jeff and I talk to so many brands every week. We're talking to new brands that are looking at becoming uh, portfolio brands with us at Front Street. Um, the other thing that they don't have, they don't have multiple locations, a lot of them. And a lot, a lot of times our advice is, go start a second location. And this is why um, you should do that. Other times, they most of them don't have an item 19 in their FDD, their franchise disclosure document. Item 19 is kind of the earnings claim. What? Um, and so why did you put an item 19 in your FDD being so new? Transparency. I wanted the numbers to speak for themselves. I knew it was going to be important for consultants to validate our brand. Our numbers in our FDD are incredibly strong. 
It also shows how inexpensive it is to open a store or location. And I think that that transparency is vital in franchising. And I could be wrong, but for our brand, it was very important. I think you're right. And uh, a lot of times, uh, this is, you know, on the show, we talk about real stuff. A lot of times when Jeff and I are talking to these brands, um, we're like, you know, tell us the numbers. Like, you're so passionate about this, that, and the other. Tell us about the numbers. And the numbers are not very compelling. And and if a brand doesn't have compelling numbers, meaning if they if they are not able to make money or make it very quickly or make very much of it, it's probably not something that they're ready to roll out nationwide. Also, I think for buyers out there, if they're if a if a, a company, a, fran a franchise brand does not have numbers in their item 19, they can't tell you, they can't share with you about how you can do. Franchisors can only tell you about the the numbers that are disclosed in the item 19 and they can't deviate that from that. Like that's what they can talk about. And so that's why we at Front Street are so uh, passionate about putting as much as we can for the brands and advising them to put as much um, clarity and information uh, on their numbers in that item 19. Um, so I love that you did that. And obviously brands, doesn't matter how new or old they are, if they have something that they want to brag about, if they have something that they're excited about, if they are making really good money, they're like, why wouldn't we want to put that in there? Um, so anyway, I, I, I can go on and on about, uh, why I love item 19s. Now with that said, item 19s are really to be, uh, are, are for you to compare again. So they're like, use the information in the item 19 whether it's the item seven, which is around how much are things going to actually cost or the item 19, how much money do I think that I can make? Use those as the litmus test as you validate with franchisees to be like, hey, this is kind of my expectation. What have you experienced? What have you seen? Where might I be off? Um, where might I, might I be too aggressive or not aggressive enough or might be too optimistic or too pessimistic? Use that because... Brands can um, spin those numbers and I know brands that do and I know brands that don't. So anybody's item 19, use that as a starting point for validation. But um, I'm so glad you have that in there and I'm sorry I went off on that little tangent, but I, <laughs> I want to protect those buyers out there that don't know what they don't know. Yeah. Just more about the brand and location. What kind of square footage are people really looking at? Is it, is it very big? Is it really small? It, anywhere between 12 and 1800 square feet. And the reason that we have that variance is that, you know, in inner city areas, um, New York, places like that, it's hard to find certain size real estate. So our smallest studio is the Hawaii studio, which is 874 square feet. Doesn't even have a bathroom in it because there's community bathrooms. And our largest store is about 3,300 square feet. That store focuses on corporate events. So we are not only um, business to consumer, we're business to business. We do a lot of big corporate events. We have relationships with some major corporations, companies, um, government entities, et cetera, where we do team building and things like that. So the size really depends on what you want your target uh, audience to be. Let's talk about more of the B2B aspect of Hawaii fluid art, because I think uh, a lot of people, when they think retail, they don't think business to business. And I know uh, business to business is something that a lot of, a lot of franchise buyers want. So give us a sense of what does business to business look like with your brand? So business to business, we have two different aspects. We have in-studio events where attorneys offices, senior facility or senior living facilities, schools, et cetera, come in store and participate. We also have something called a mobile unit where we can go to you. We go to hotels con for conventions. You know, we just did a very large convention for a popular makeup brand. Um, we can go to assisted living facilities where their, where their um, residents can't come to us. And that business to business is very important because it's large groups. You know, we've, we just did a group for the Make-A-Wish um, a couple days ago. We had 54 people for Make-A-Wish. So at a corporate level, we create relationships for our franchisees 
we are constantly creating new relationships with car dealerships and you, you name it. Um, and that is our responsibility to help RC. And that business to business is vital. Uh, you know, we we do huge we do huge format or not just the standard size. We do all the way up to four foot by five foot. So we'll have attorneys' offices come in and create all the art for their new, for their new law office. I mean, it's a lot of. What fun. do you mean by that? Okay, what do you mean? Like, give me give me a real life example of creating art for an attorney's office because I think. People are thinking, oh, this is not just a mom and her kid or the ladies night out. They're not going to create art for a law office. So give a go into detail on what that that actually looked like. What, what happened? OK, so we had a law office that wanted to do a, a corporate training, a, a team building. And they came in and they saw that we had these different size canvases. You know, they start small and they go big and they just said, well, we all want to make a small one, but then can we make a big one for our law office wall? And we're like, absolutely. We have time for that in this studio session. And so they ended up making several large to the tune of $850 per canvas pieces for their, um, for their law firm. And we just had it happen again with the dentist office. They came in, saw that we offered big, you know, four foot by five foot canvases. They all did one individually. And then they worked on the other one as a team. And so they had a team building experience to create a beautiful piece of art that they're proud to display in the office and they all had a hand in it. And so that's really what white flute art is about is it's about those experiences. And so we see great success with our business to business um, platform. All right, so you got a guy without an artistic bone in his body with me. Okay. I I come and um, and I want to I want, let's say it's me, Jeff, and Jim, my business partners, and Bobby over at Front Street, and we're competing. I'm horrible at art. How do I, how do I get something that I would um, uh, not want to throw away? Is it possible for me to create something that doesn't end up in the trash? I can guarantee you. And beat those other guys? Like, I want to beat those other guys, too. I want to have something that's better than them. Yes, you can beat those other guys. So this is what happens when the guys get drug in on a date. The guys are like, oh, and then we explain to them how easy it is. You know, we're going to layer some paint in a cup. We're going to pour it on a canvas. We're going to tilt it around. By the end of class, the guys are like, hey, can I do another one? Can I do another one? <laughs> this was great. When can I come back? And they're, I I'm not kidding. We have a adult men doing these little happy dances because they made something so beautiful. The thing about our art form is that everybody's art turns out amazing and guess what? If for some reason you don't like it, we just scrape it off and let you do it again for nothing. No. Yes, we do. Our cost, our cost, our product cost is so low. All of our classes operate between a 90 and 95% profit margin. In order to keep a customer happy and make them a return customer for life, it's worth scraping off 28 cents of paint and letting them do it again. Yeah. It's all about customer service. <laughs> yeah, it is. All right, let's talk about your team. No, let's let's wait before we talk about the team. Let's talk about advisors because, uh, you know, we're advisors to you, not franchise development, only advisory. Um, and it's one of the things that we offer at, at Front Street Equity Partners. Um, and I want the audience to understand um, why advisors are vital. It doesn't have to be Front Street. But I mean, it probably is not going to be Front Street. Uh, but you know, maybe, uh, people have others that might advise and they have experience. They want to build a board of advisors where they give a little slice of, of, of possible equity or, or, or something like that. But I think advisors are so important. I love to be the dumbest guy in the room. I put myself in those rooms. I love to, um, learn from others. And that's how I've been able to do what I've done in franchising. Cause that's just my, my, just how I am. Um, what was it about Front Street and the advisory aspect uh, that uh, that you found interesting, interesting enough to become one of our portfolio brands? Well, you don't know what you don't know. And in franchising, I've done a good job, but that's not enough for me. I want to do a great job. And in order to be great, I need help from people who know more than I do. My franchisees deserve the best that there is. And I think partnering with you and your team 
is an example of helping them get the best. If you think you know everything in franchising, you've already lost. You really have to count on others who know more than you to help you level up. And I'm about leveling up. And I am extremely excited to be partnered with you and Front Street Brands and to see the incredible success that Hawaii Fluid Art is going to experience because of that partnership. I think that's an important piece. Um, you don't know what you don't know. And, um, and the franchising community is great in general. There are... Um, there are places for people that have brands, uh, founders of brands to get good information, different co conferences out there. Like, you know, my friend Brad and Lane, they put on uh, springboard and the unconference, such a great place. And there's so many amazing people there that give help to younger brands. I love that. There are, uh, people like Scott Abbott, my friend, Scott Abbott, who puts on a monthly kind of, a a a, a, a zoom for service-based brands and he's a giver. And I love that about Scott. One of the things that um, I just put out a poll in the Facebook group this morning that that came from a conversation that I had with Bobby Brennan, a partner over at Front Street two days ago. And then I followed up with Jeff yesterday. I'm like, hey, we should do this thing. So we like, hey, what if we started a, a monthly free Zoom session for emerging brands just to help them with franchise development, talk about franchise development because there's really nobody out there that's able to mentor in franchise development. And so the point of all of that is there are so many resources for brands that you don't have to pay for. And then there are some that you do pay for when you are ready to level up. And I'm telling you, when you start to pay people to level up, as I saw, I got to another friend of mine yesterday that helped a brand that I'm talking to. They paid a, they, uh, the founder paid her $10,000 to, get some help with franchise development. And I love hearing that. I love seeing that relationship between those two, someone paying $10,000 to get a franchise development plan. That's awesome. And that tells me something about that founder that she is ready to level up and she is, uh, she's going to do great because she's paying and not, and, and I know my other friend that got the 10,000 for the uh, advice will give her way more than 10,000 of value um, even beyond just the initial, the initial deliverables. So I, I love it when I'm around people like you that are humble, um, that want to level up and, um, are going to do whatever it takes to help their franchisees be successful. So my question is, I was talking to a friend of mine that's been in franchising for a long time. And he's like, and he's in the mastermind. He's a uh, successful, he had a successful exit as a large franchisee to private equity in another brand right now, kind of disillusioned. And he's like, Eric, are these, are all franchisors just always trying to take from franchisees? Are they always just, you know, doing what's best for them and don't really have the franchisee in mind? And I'm like, Hey, you don't get to have these conversations like I do with Maya who um, we had nothing to like, uh, you know, we have private conversations and they're focused around how do we help franchisees? How do I take delayed gratification with, with payment, with building, you know, cash flow and all these other things I'm fine delaying. So my franchisees can win sooner. Like he doesn't get to have those conversations that I have with you and, and other people. And I'm like, Hey, there are people out there that are doing the right thing that are franchisee focused. And it's not just talk. And I love, um, I love being able to have those conversations with him and others because I get to tell them about the, the good founders, the good leaders in franchising. And they're not just, they just don't have a, uh, again, just saying it from the stage or saying it on a Facebook post, how they're franchisee focused. Cause there are some people that I see out there that are saying that, that are not franchisee focused. And then there are others that are franchisee focused. They're saying the same thing. And yet I know they can back it up. So that's why I love being with people like you, good people, creating great teams and really are for the franchisee. So why, like, I mean, that's who you are, but why, why are you that way? I mean, like talk to that guy that is disillusioned right now. Why are you so franchisee focused right now? And, and, and what could change that to become, uh, not franchisee focused and, and just focused on more money for the franchise or. How do you prevent that from happening? 
the way that I feel is that the responsibility that I carry as a franchisor is massive. These franchisees, these potential franchisees, are looking for leadership and guidance and support. And it is my obligation, I believe in servant leadership, it is my obligation to give everything that I can to my franchisees, whether it's my time, my effort, my energy, or my money being reinvested into the company over and over again. I've been working for free for two and a half years, and I'm okay with that. I absolutely reinvest every single penny to help make the brand better. It's an honor for me to be able to do that. And that sense of responsibility is real. And like I said, it's an honor. And to the second point of your question, what happens with brands that become money focused? I don't know because that's not who I am. But what my suspicion is, is that sometimes franchisees can be difficult and they feel like they are owed something. And it's a lot every day to make sure that everybody is taken care of. And maybe some franchisors just get jaded and think, hands up, man, I can't make you happy. And they step back emotionally. And I refuse to do that. I am emotionally invested in the success of every single one of my franchisees. Every single one. It is my obligation to do everything in my power to help them succeed. And my corporate team feels the same way. I think some of that comes from having a good process on on bringing in or selling or awarding franchisees. Um, I know a lot of brands that Jeff, Jeff and I always always say Jeff and I, because we talk to a lot of these uh, brands that are thinking about becoming uh, a portfolio brand with us. And uh, we just had a call yesterday with one. And uh, we said, tell us about your franchise development process. You know, that's what I want to hear. Immediately bragging, we can close somebody in two to three weeks. That, that's what that's what we we shoot for. We can we can get somebody from their first call, get them the FDD, close them three weeks later. They are a franchisee through a series of, you know, three to four Zoom calls. Immediately, Jeff and I know what each other are thinking. We're like, yikes, how do you well you get to know somebody over three to four hours on Zoom and enter into a 10-year relationship, a 10-year marriage, a 10-year partnership? Um, with that person. Um, uh, yeah, you can do a background check, but like what, like you want to know more. I, we think a brand should know more about that person and that person should know more about that brand before making a decision. So we immediately, like that's what, that's what's going through Jeff and I's mind in about a half a second. And, and so we ask like, oh, great. Um, do you ever think that, you know, you might want to extend that to get to know them more immediately there? It was met with, no, I, I can, we, we know them and we're selling a bunch of franchisees and you know, it's an easy business model and this, that, and the other. And, and it is, it's a good business model. We really like the founder and this, that, and the other, but we see this as a common mistake. Now, if he would have said, Hey, it's been work. And so that brand is probably out for us unless something changes. Now, if they would have said, Hey, um, we've been closing them like we, we, three weeks, we have a new franchisee and we got, we got five of them now or 10 of them now, or it doesn't matter the number. That's what we have now. But, uh, Eric, Jeff, you know, what do you think? What do you think about that process? Do you, do you think we should be extending it? What are the challenges with that? What don't I know about the, 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 the possible pitfalls? But there was none of that, and I think it's just being unaware. I don't think for him it was a it was a, um, a a pride thing. I think it was just him being unaware. He hasn't been kicked in the teeth, punched in the face, you know, um, yet. Um, and so uh, we were we love to work with founders that are humble, and um, and they don't know they know that they don't know what they don't know, and that's why we love working with people like you. So give us a, give us a little bit of uh, insight into your sales process. Cause I know like we have ours at our franchise sales organization piece of front street where it's very, you know, we have, we have a whole process. It's different than your process. So 
give us a, an idea of what your sales process is like. Well, our sales process takes about six weeks and it's really based on relationship building and learning about the potential franchisee and them learning about us. We have uh, multiple phone calls. We don't do any group Zoom calls. Um, I'm the first point of contact at this time. I uh, reach out to the potential franchisee and I have a half an hour conversation with them and it's getting to know that. What do you do? What do you like? What are your hobbies? What made you look into franchising, et cetera. Uh, fast forward a little bit. They're going to talk to my director of franchise expansion and then they're going to be given homework. And that homework is a substantial amount of homework. We want to know all the things about you. What, what kind of animals do you have? Give us a sample marketing plan. What's your ideal work day? Um, it's, it's a hefty packet because it helps us get to know them. Then we work through the process and they're going to meet with our director of uh, real estate acquisition. We're going to talk about territories and what locations and, and every conversation that we have, we have a scoring system that we at the leadership team will score that no. conversation. And we will have conversations about that franchisee and whether or not we think that they're going to be a good fit for our family because we're a family. And I'm not going to bring in somebody into the brand that's going to piss off my other franchisees because they're all about them or they don't want to share or anything. We share with each other. My success is your success. Your success is their success. And so it's vital that we find people that are a good fit. And personally, I can't make that decision in three weeks. Not only that, but I personally meet face to face with every potential franchisee at a Founders Day and I spend time with them. So we have a Founders Day and we have a Discovery Day. And that Founders Day is me time with them. And the Discovery Day is about our processes and meeting the rest of the corporate team. But there is a lot of effort and energy that goes into a potential franchisee. And I can tell you that I say no more often than I say yes. And that's hard to do as an emerging brand because well, it costs a lot of money to run a franchise entity. But if you don't make good decisions now, you are going to regret it for the next 10 years. And so that's just the way that we do our system. So not everyone if, you know, in 2024 may have a first call with Maya. Um, you might, you might still be doing that, you know, um, and it might change as the, as the brand grows. It might be the second call or the third call, or maybe just on Founders Day. I don't know. We're not going to tell you what to do. We'll give you advice, you know, like we do with all of our brands, but, um, but we love that. And, and I just think that mindset of wanting to meet the people is incredibly important as well. Um, I, we were talking to another brand, different brand the other day. And, uh, again, they were bragging to us about why they don't do discovery days and just like, it's the greatest thing. We don't have to do discovery days because we can sell them without it. And, and, and Jeff and I are just, again, just thinking, Hmm, possible red flag here. Yeah. Just because you can sell, should you, um, and, and, uh, so talk to, so we're believers in meeting face to face, like us at front street, we'd love our brands to meet face to face with the, with the franchisees Now during COVID, a lot of that didn't happen, but, um, if you can, I think it's important. Um, what would you say to a founder that does not believe in meeting uh, these uh, candidates face to face? Like, give us a story of maybe someone that you all of a sudden meeting them face to face. It was like, oh wow, I didn't see this over Zoom. Um, I'm glad we didn't enter into that ten year partnership together. I have a perfect example. We had a Founders Day. <clears throat> the woman came, complained the whole time. I don't like your paint colors. Neon's tacky. I mean, it was just like constantly attacking the brand, the brand. And I said, why, why are you here? Well, because I thought if I told you face, you'd change it. And I just sat there quietly and I said, no, this is what we're going to do. She goes, well, when I'm a franchisee, I'm going to paint it whatever color I want to. And I said, and you are not going to be one of my chosen franchisees, plain and simple. I personally think people that don't have founders days or discovery days or take the time to meet a potential franchisee face to face is going to end up at a lawsuit sooner rather than later. Yeah, it's um that's a perfect example. And you didn't see that before. You didn't you didn't have that if you hadn't had that face to face, she would uh she'd be doing things her own way. Absolutely. Uh, she would be a thorn in your side. And and franchisors, 
I would imagine that you have thorns in your side and you're going to get them regardless. They're going to sneak through or something's going to change or whatnot. So being a franchisor is not easy. That's why Jeff and I always say first rule in franchising, don't franchise your business. Because so many people get so excited about franchising your business and they think that's the ticket to a large exit. If you do it right, it could be the ticket to a large exit, a good payday at some point. But boy, you are now no longer in the art, like the the fluid art business and helping people, you know, fan, fancy, fancy actors and actresses and, you know, all of that. You're not doing that anymore. You are working with franchisees and you need to help them be successful. And, um, and they are going to not, you know, they're going to, uh, help build that brand, but you're going to do it together. Um, so that, that's, that's the difference. But the first rule of franchising is don't franchise your business, at least know what you're getting into before you do it. All right. Um, let's talk about the leadership you have. I'm impressed with some of your leaders that you have. Um, you have 20 ish locations open. Give us a sense of the infrastructure at the corporate office. So we have uh, 20 team members, 20 corporate team members, and we have everything from um, director of real estate acquisition who helps choose territories, pick zip codes, uh, and look at real estate with the franchisee. We have a director of construction management that helps oversee our build outs, even though our build outs are very simple. We've built out enough of them that we know where the hiccups are. And so we want to address those hiccups before they become hiccups. We have our information givers and those information givers are what other people would call salespeople, but we aren't salesy. And so we have our information givers. And then we have our entire marketing team and that. But I think one of the most important things that we have is our franchisee success managers. And we have a team and it is their job to make sure that the Z's feel seen, heard, and taken care of. They have weekly calls that are scheduled. You don't have to do every week. The longer you've been in business, the, you know, the, the, the more spread out those calls are. They are their point of contact. They have an issue with a Facebook post. They have an issue with a Google, whatever. They're going to reach out to their um, franchise success manager who's just going to handle it for them. They don't have to worry. Uh, the, the list goes on and on. Um, we, I believe in hiring before you need somebody. I believe in having people that believe in our, our culture. And I think one of the things that's really interesting is that five of our franchisees are actually corporate team members because we are an absentee platform business and they have the time, effort, energy, and love for our brand to help make it better. They wanted to join our corporate team. I can't think of a bigger compliment than to have somebody want to lead next to me on the corporate team than one of my franchisees. And I feel very honored that they choose to do so. I, uh, I one com <clears throat> coming to mind and I'm like, he's amazing. And I know the level of trust. I know the level of relationship. I know, I know the level of responsibility and, um, and I can just echo, like you built an amazing team and there's a, and I've had conversations where they're just bragging on you. Like they absolutely love you. And they, um, the one that I'm thinking about, like he would totally run through a brick wall for you. And that's the type of people that you want building a brand with you. And so like, yeah, like this is why, um, I'm so like, I'm just so happy to be, to be, uh, uh have a small part of, uh, a part of, uh, this journey with you. Um, as you, as you are, um, I'm thinking franchisees, you mentioned like kind of that absentee they have or semi absentee, or they have that time to run their business and to be part of the corporate, the corporate team. Um, give us a sense of like, what does a franchise owner do in the business? So it really depends how many units they have. Like for instance, I haven't even been to my wife's store in two years. <laughs> so there's different options. You can be an, a totally absentee owner where all you do is run the payroll. And it, it, that's even if you want to do that, or you could give that to the responsibility to one of your key holders. Or you can be a semi-absentee semi owner where you stop in and hang out or, you know, go to the Chamber of Commerce meetings and generate business relationships, et cetera. And then there's the total hands-on owner, the person who works in the store every single day. 
The majority of our owners are absentee owners. They own multiple locations. You don't even need a manager until you have three or five locations. And then that manager can oversee all of the locations. And so I think one of the beautiful things about our brand is it allows you freedom, freedom to spend time with your family, freedom to play softball or go bird watching. Um, and, and that's one yeah. of the reasons that we have several of our franchisees work at our corporate location because they fell in love with the brand. Their stores are successful and they wanted to help other franchisees see the same success that they're seeing. Um, a lot of brands say that they're semi-absentee and they sell it, award it semi-absentee and then franchisees get involved and they're like, oh, this is not semi-absentee. This is, this is, this is anything but semi-absentee and they have a large monthly nut that they need to cover. And so now they're working in the business versus like building, building out more locations and, and things like that. What, it, you know, so it sounds like you have franchisees who will validate that it is semi-absentee and that's how they're running it. And just the fact about your location, you know, in, in Hawaii and how long it's been since you've been there. So is that a pretty fair statement that you think, um, that validates semi-absentee? Absolutely. I wouldn't still be opening corporate locations around the United States if it was me in there grinding every day. I don't have time for that. <laughs> my corporate team members that own multiple locations, you know, one of one of my guys owns 10. He has three open right now. Um, and he works 16 hours a day for corporate. Absolutely. Uh, our franchisees, if they choose to be an absentee owner, they they are 100 percent an absentee owner. They check in on the store, you know, phone call once a week type of thing. Um, semi-absentee, you know, you're going to work a little more. We strongly suggest that you're not, and that you're not in the store every day because you're not an 1850 an hour person. You're a thousand dollar an hour person. Go create relationships with businesses and corporations and, and entities and bring more business to your studio. Don't sit in there and teach paint classes. That's why we have instructors that we train for you. So this is not a buy yourself a job, become a paint instructor and, and teach people how to paint. This is get out in your community, be an ambassador for your business and work on the business, like truly work on the business and not in the business. A 100%, you know, the goal is get one up and running, open your second. When the second one's almost built out, start looking for your third lease. You know, you have multiple units and that's how you build independence and growth and and financial success is overseeing multiple units, but only giving each unit three hours a week, something like that. Let your team, the people that we've trained for you, because we go to you and train your employees and you, you know, as an eight-day intensive training program, let those people help create your success and you go out and live your life and make the connections so you can open your next door and your next door and your next door. And that's how it's based. I love it. How do your franchisees or your locations get leads? How do they get customers in the door? I'm guessing it's location. Yes. Being part of it. Great question. So there are many factors. Hey, I'm a podcast host. I have the best podcast in franchising. So I have more good questions to ask. Good. I like questions. I love answering questions. So at a corporate level, we handle a lot of it. So we have, there is social media, obviously. Uh, there is Chamber of Commerce, local businesses. We have we have programs in place at a corporate level that we manage all of the influencer accounts. So we get influencers to come into your stores. We have a press release department where we do the press releases and we communicate with the news media. So we get Channel 5 Fox in your store and we get this in your store and that in your store. We have membership programs that are similar to um, like Costco, but it's for a government entity that lists out all of the different discounts and programs in all of the United States. And you just type in your zip code if you work for the government and you type in entertainment, boop, Hawaii Fluid Arts gonna pop up. We manage all of that at a corporate level for our franchisees. We believe it is their job to run their business well and help create relationships in their community. But as a, out of, as a franchisor and at, as an executive team level, we are going to implement everything that we can to help drive business. And so we have a lot 
of different areas that drive business to our stores. That that gets me excited. Can you tell? I love talking about that. I can. I can. A good question gets you excited. I need to get. I need to get some more good questions. I think we need to. I think we should record a second one um, in a couple months to talk about new store openings, how you're doing new store openings, um, lessons that you've learned um, between now and then. Like as you as you guys are out there getting, you know, what is it, forty something locations open up um, in the next probably four months. I think that's one area that franchisors. Uh, could use some help in like how do you have we pick the right location um and then how do you help that franchisee have a very strong uh pre-sales pre-opening grand opening and first month in in business and make a splash and um i know you guys do a great job at that but i think that would i think that's our next podcast what do you think sounds good i think it sounds like a great plan how do people get in touch with you very simply, you go to the website and it says, uh, we'd like more information. You can click on it, fill out a form, or you can just shoot me an email, info at hawaiifluidart.com. And uh, yeah, I'm very good about responding very quickly. So I look forward to anybody that reaches out. I can't wait to do this. So do you have, are you, do you have one in New Orleans? Uh, we are opening one in New Orleans. The closest one to you is uh, South Dakota. No, no, I'm in South Dakota, but I'm thinking New Orleans because we'll be there together. We're, you're on the other side of the state, though. You are in you are in Sioux Falls, I think. Yeah, we are. We're in Sioux Falls. Well, why don't you just fly to Dallas? Just fly to Dallas and get away from that cold, and then you could go to like eight different studios and check them out. Well, we got we got this El Nino or El Nina right happening right now. It's going to be 55 degrees this weekend. So I cannot leave when it's 55 here. That's like a very unusual, but I'll be in Vegas. I'll be in new Orleans. I'll be in, in, um, Mexico. I'll be in, uh, in, in Phoenix or Scottsdale and then all in the first quarter. So I, I should be able to get into one of those. Come to Vegas and I'll be there and we can, we can play with pain. You can see what the magic's about. And by the way, anybody listening to this and you want to to see it and just go meet her as she's opening up that location, you should totally go do it. I think you get the sense that she likes talking to people and she likes meeting meeting people. So I'm going to get this released sooner than later so people can come see you in Vegas. Sounds like a plan. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Mahalo. Mahalo. I know I've I know Hawaii. I also know I know, I know Hawaii. I know the Hawaii. Uh, Phrases in uh, Hawaiian, and I also know, oh, I forgot the name of it. What do you call people that don't really live there? Oh, um, well, it depends, but there is a- Howley's. How Howley? Yeah, it's a little, it, yeah. That's, that, that means they don't like you and you don't live there. Oh, <laughs> I've never had anybody call me that. Okay, then you're good. But I also have heard that that doesn't really mean what most people think. It has a different meaning. It, it's just slang, you know, it's just slang. And so when I lived on the islands, I was very blessed. Um, and what I took away from the islands was the, the character and the love of the local people. And it's what I miss the most. And um, it's what helps drive my business to give that pono, that love, that aloha to everybody that I come in contact with, because it was a gift that was given to me. I love it. it be, I love the Hawaiian culture and the weather. All right, Maya, we better wrap this up. All right, buddy. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the franchise. With anything from starting your own franchise to growing your current franchise business, please visit scalablefranchise.com.